Hi, I'm Janet Beale of the New York Kurdish Culture Center. I'm not Kurdish, but I'm a friend of Kurds. Um, in this month of March, we're celebrating Kurdish Heritage Month, um, presenting high points of Kurdish culture that we've encountered recently. And today I'm interviewing um, a major Kurdish American contributor to Kurdish culture. That would be Pedram Baldari, who is an artist but not just, but not in the artists that maybe some people think of artists as making paintings or two-dimensional works. Pedram is an interdisciplinary artist who is who who works in three dimensions. In, in he does installations that are specific to sites. He makes soundscapes. He makes performance art. And I'm I well, hope you will join us in welcoming join me in welcoming Pedram for this for this discussion. Thank you so much uh, for having me, Janet. It's a pleasure. So if I could just give you a little background. You grew up, as I have read, in the city of, is it pronounced Sine? Sana, yes. Sina? Or Sanandaj in Rojalat, which is East Kurdistan, near the Iraqi border during the war of 18, 1980 to 88. And judging from his work, he experienced air raids and chemical attacks. This was also the time when the Iraqi Ba'ath Party was launching its genocidal campaign against the Kurdish people. Pedram studied architecture at the University of Tehran, then studio art at Texas Tech University. Since 2010, he has had solo and group shows at many very prestigious art, sh art shows and museums in Europe and North America and Asia, as well as fellowships and residencies. He's currently based in the Detroit metro area in Michigan. So, Pedram, first, can I talk a little bit about when you left and what under what circumstances? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, I left um, in early 2012 for for the first time. I I got to leave uh, to do a fellowship. Um, and a solo exhibition at uh, Victor and Albert Museum in London, mm -hmm. um, sponsored by the Delfina Foundation. Um, I applied for this uh, fellowship, and to my surprise, I got it. Uh, so I spent um, a while in there uh, as... Um, as I was exiting the country, um, a major kind of political upheaval happened through which the Basij forces uh, went over the UK embassy and occupied the, the embassy and set it on fire. Um, and at that time I thought about a work, uh, an artwork. So I took with me a bottle of water from a river uh, and then did a performance um, in front of the the closed Iranian embassy in UK, which kind of had a major effect on my safety going back. So immediately uh, I thought of um, kind of make it permanent. So I applied to different universities and I ended up in Texas. Oh. Um, that's how, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> that must've been quite a culture shock. <laughs> yeah, in a bit, yeah. <laughs> but university <laughs> towns are maybe a little more welcoming than yeah. areas. Yeah. It was very actually interesting. It was a, it was interesting setup. I, I have, I think I'm always blessed with seeing many different aspects of the America, just from New York City or LA or San Francisco, but America is vast. Uh, and then when you get to experience all these different aspects of what makes this melting pot, both culturally and politically, I think it's it's good. It, it is difficult, you know, to be... The, the maybe in many spaces the only black sheep amongst the the white sheep but <laughs> but 
it also has some some potential i think uh, mm -hmm. and those potentials uh help me understand many kind of things that uh can help maybe a scholar or an artist to actually find their standing and footing in a new environment uh-huh uh-huh so, so do you, do you were you making art already back in you must have been back in back in um in Tehran or in in Rojalat uh, yeah, so I I had an architecture career, uh, yeah. and and I was uh, simultaneously I was very very uh, fascinated uh, by art theories, um, theories that are related to sociopolitics in general, mm -hmm. also various forms of artistic um, response. To these elements uh, so I always saw the act of making um, a, a radical a revolutionary form of generating knowledge mm -hmm. um, and that is why in between like uh, different forms of intellectual work I, I, I always gravitated toward the act of making Mm -hmm. um then um uh, and making by mean like engaging with your hands with your entire body forming something like uh rather than only relying on the 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 premises of language mm -hmm. uh so for me the the act the the visual language became um a more uh, kind of what you call it liberating act hmm. so I saw art from the beginning through this lens and it's still with me mm -hmm. and that kind of has become the the background right. of the way I make it mm -hmm. which uh, from the beginning my professors here in America, they were, they always were telling me, Pedram, you got to focus, focus on what this, this project was great. Keep doing this. And I was like, but I did it once. I want to experience something else. <laughs> and, and that, and, and I also understand, you know, it, it, it being around people who, who actually focus on the act of craftsman, craftsmanship, uh, and continue engaging in one process over and over. Uh, I appreciate the the the, the whole entire energy. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But but also it, it can become a place where your mind can leave the real world behind, and you just kind of make patterns day in and day out. And that's kind of your mind palace. And, and and my mind can never or still has not been able to disengage from the reality of which makes the, the history and the makings of my nation, the Kurds. Mm -hmm. And that is why... I'm always saying like, I don't have that kind of luxury, <laughs> but maybe one day, you know, one day I will just focus on uh, one specific medium. Well, and I think, I think that you're, it's in looking over, looking over your work recently and watching the videos on your amazing website, which I recommend to everybody. It'll be in the, in the show notes below. Um, it seems clear that you have, you're definitely evol evolving as an artist. You seem to, to, I find that that your work it doesn't repeat, but it builds on the themes that you had worked with before. But every time takes things to a new level, or asks a new question, or works from a different angle. And I think the one of the beautiful things about doing installation art and performance art, as you do, is that 
it arrests the viewer. The viewer can't just walk past it the way they walk past a painting. You need to stop and take it in. And maybe it's the same for creating it as well. I don't know. But um, it's kind of, it tends to explode kind of the, it's explode the familiar. So for example, I'm thinking of um, one of the most compelling ones that I encountered was your Love Note to Liberty from 2019. It's about the theme of immigration. And this is 2000, it's 2019, the Trump administration, the Muslim ban. A ban. There's all kinds of complications going on. There's a huge helium balloon, 10 feet in diameter with a yellow caution tape around it. And if just this juxtaposition, oh, and a key, a key from the Statue of Liberty somehow hanging at the bottom and somehow juxtaposing the, the Statue of Liberty with caution tape is just, just remarkable to me. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts you might want to share about that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was during a time that I was thinking about the act of making through like one suitcase how i could make something that would fit in a small suitcase uh so my art my artwork is not bound by like you know moving all over because it was real i mean the the ban and this all these threats to deporting everyone and it, it felt like the future is no longer certain mm -hmm. um and the idea of liberty and the the statue of liberty that that kind of fundamental aspect of the american promise right uh that this is a land you come in and you do this thing where you give back to the society and you can thrive and you all of these things uh I, I felt that there is a major social political uh, structure around who gets to be and 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 feel and embrace liberty. And I was also thinking about Kurdistan as well, the the dream of liberty amongst the Kurds um, and how that, kind of packs a major punch in me every time I engage in, in these kind of concepts. Mm -hmm. um, so I I got this huge balloon. Uh, it's, a, it's a blimp, basically, uh, 10 feet diameter, and it's filled with helium. And I made a choke out of uh, various material and wrapped it with caution tape and and choked this balloon as I was uh, kind of inflating it. Uh, and the choke would put a kind of pressure on the balloon. And then I implemented a, a valve under the balloon that based on pressure, it slowly like deflates the balloon. So it becomes kind of goes to a state of equilibrium with the choke. Mm -hmm. And then there is the key, uh, the key of the Statue of Liberty, which I found on <laughs> eBay. You didn't know anything about it. <laughs> you found it on eBay. That's amazing. And, and my friend who is a calligrapher, I uh, we I asked him to put a... a a poetry by Shirko Bikas, uh, this um, Kurdish poet about a wall that is filled with political lies. So that's in the background of this. Um, and, and so the idea is this whole process um, maintains the balloon, doesn't let it leave or go up. Uh, and then the balloon starts deflating to drop the choke, and as it drops the choke, it has lost so much helium that still stays where it is. So this idea of you know um, 
escaping go you know the the idea of liberty as a as a as a metaphor as a as a goal uh amongst the entire human race mm. uh, for me always with the social political and economic background that encapsulates us in a serious in a in a in a in a landscape or in a in a dynamic that this always has been staying as an abstract idea mm. you know mm. especially if i would put it again in the idea of the kurdistan the the our will to receive statehood mm -hmm. to be free from the occupiers and the colonizers um yeah so it's it's a kind of a poetic sociopolitical statement um yeah no, it was uh, wonderful to, to think of using helium balloon as balloon as a metaphor for freedom and then you know working with the constraints on that freedom it was just yeah. Yeah. You know, because yeah. helium balloons, you you f fill it up and you leave it, and it just goes outside of the atmosphere. It, it just, you know, it, it's so it's so funny. This very simple thing just can go, you know, forever until it explodes. <laughs> right. right, it can leave. <laughs> uh, so. so the next one that I was thinking about a lot is. Um, one that you call, it's from two years later, 2021. It's called, When the War Ended, We All Wondered, What Should We Do Now? <laughs> what a wonderful title. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a slanted board with some sandbags and a hole. And it reminded me of a game that I see people play out on the, the street of my, of my town where you try to throw things into the hole. <laughs> um, and when I read a little bit about it, sure enough, it turns out that, that one of the inspirations was a certain game that you encountered in the Midwest, but that it reminded you of some things from long ago back in Rajalat. So yeah. can you explain how that came about a little bit? Yeah, the, the, it's funny. You know, when I moved to Minnesota, to Minneapolis, I saw for the first time beanbag toss or cornhole, people call it different things. And these tiny little bags, people play with it. I don't know. They invited me to participate in the game um, in a backyard. And I saw it. I was like, oh, they look like tiny little military sandbags. And 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 people around me were kind of baffled, you know, flabbergasted by why do you make that kind of connection? And I realized there is actually all these different various experiences, this worldview, the, this, the visual references or baggage for me may very much defer or, or throw me into parallel uh, stages or layers of reality with, with very close friends around me who never have had that experience. So, this stayed with me for a while until, um, you know, a while later, um, I asked myself why why I made that kind of connotation, and and I realized, yeah, it it's it's embedded in this story of um, living through this war zone, and and many schools as kids were bombed. Um, by the Iraqi uh, army, by Saddam Hussein, and simultaneously, the Iranian forces within Roshalat also treated us as a completely occupied people, meaning like it wasn't like the Iranian army was this liberating or saving forces. We weren't, we were actually more scared as kids of them than the army that bombs us, but we have never seen the, the Iraqi army. Um, moving 
fast forward, uh, the war ends and the idea is, so what should we do, the schools, with we, we lived in classrooms, they were like tiny with 60 kids. And the, the there was no wall, it was all sandbags all the way to the roof. There was no window um, because of the bomb. So, and, and these sandbags, you know, could help and they were within inside for some reason of the class rather than outside, but I mean, whatever. And when the war ends, the school is, what What the hell we should do with these things? So they make up this funny game because we had like, you know, physical activity class, but we didn't really have like a, a football field or basket. It was just the school's yard and that was it. So they said, whichever group every day who carries like more sandbags and dumps it into this hole they they created in the schoolyard they will win a juice box and so that was our job uh to do that uh and this kind of juxtaposes this sort of for me that was a game that was something that occupied me and 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 felt as fun as any other game. I loved doing that thing, even though it, it may be crazy. But as a kid, I was like, I couldn't wait to go to school and maybe perhaps win a juice box, <laughs> you know. So yeah. it has some kind of yeah that that sort of. I always talk about. The idea in America about the the act of war that or or some kind of trauma that that breaks people that maybe they haven't met across the world beyond repair is a myth. For me, life forms various creative processes to continue even in a war zone and i don't want to like um fan, uh, kind of create this jolly image around living through war but but i'm also trying to maintain and reclaim what kind of person survives a war zone and and have me create that image rather than someone who has never had that experience. So it's more of a, a form of resistance, but at the same time, uh, reclaiming my truth. Um, and, and it can get murky and convoluted, um, but but I also found that through my work, I can stop being a victim and more of a creator, someone that holds the truth, someone who like projects its subjectivity, their truth out into the world. And when you can do that, um, that's sort of a an act in my uh in my mind it's a radical act of creating um and not letting other forces to create or shape you into this um fragile sort of pitiful or you know i i always battle with that image um yeah it seems like much of your work is is a dialogue between this the the man you are now in living in the united states and the and the younger man um living back there and grappling with that experience and the changes you've gone through and it seems to me that 
when I look at your work, it's it, and you talk about resistance. You're sort of building up, huh, building up your own personal resistance by engaging with the traumas that you've been through. Um, at the same time as art in its in itself is, as you say, a weapon. It's a form of resistance, and it, they strengthen each other. That by resisting in this way, you're strengthening yourself, but you're also strengthening um, awareness of the Kurdish dilemma, and and that and is making contributions in both ways. So, have great respect for that. Um, and then, in, if I can move on to another work that you that sure. it involved directly grappling with with the with with arms in effect um it's a soundscape that you made called variations of sounds traveling between a barrel and a heart a barrel and a heart what kind of barrel would that be well it's not the kind of barrel that collects water it's a gun barrel it turns out that you have been somehow there's a buyback program maybe in minneapolis where you could acquire you know when people want to turn in want to just get rid of their firearms they can turn them over to the police and good that's i wish more people would do that but then you can some you somehow acquired some of these firearms and were able to dismantle them and transform them into musical instruments and then have musicians perform on them and it's just um if there were ever uh, a metaphor for for turning turning um arms into if, to peaceful uses this would be this would be it it reminds me a little bit actually of the work of um uh I think his name his name is Saiwan Saidi, who made the film Softest Metal, that those of you who attended the New York Kurdish um, Film Festival this uh, in 2023 will recognize. You've seen his movie. He takes metal sculptures and makes them into, that he found it's the detritus of war, scrap metal around him, and makes it into, it makes them into, um, into sculptures of children skipping rope and so on. But this is very different. It's not representational. What you're doing is taking instruments and you're you're letting them, putting repurposing them for a purpose that is that is creative, that is experiential, that forces, that grabs the viewer, the listener by the collar and says, hey, listen to what these things are capable of. And for me it was uh, very it was very inspiring to listen to that work just it's very hypnotic but and it's very trance like but my mind wandered in all courts all sorts of wonderful places while i was listening to it um how did, how did it how what what was it like to to create this for you for you for you what was your experience of creating this nice uh, i appreciate your comments uh it was very fascinating so these guns either they are a part of a case has been resolved and police can because it's confiscated can be returned back like sold in in an auction mm -hmm. or it's through also gun buyback program people surrendering their firearms no questions asked and police dismantles them there mm -hmm. in, a, in a booth the funds are gathered by various um social justice organizations uh, and mostly is done like across different parts of America. Um, Art is my weapon is one of the organizations behind this. And so the first time I see this pile of, you know, dismantled uh, rifles, I I I somehow jump mentally to this event where. The Iranian security forces are in the hospital that my dad is working and my uncle is working, collecting men mm. and and pinning them down in, in the yard and attempting to execute them one by one until one of the to their to their claim 
the Komala uh, sympathizer or Komala member uh, kind of surrenders himself. There is no daycare, so I'm either with my dad who works in a hospital or with my mom who works also as a um as a kind of the school nurses or school so I'm either in in their workplaces with them uh so I try to intervene uh with this with this group uh cuz I thought like I can do it as a kid I go grab one of them by leg and I'm like let like like let them go and and that was the first time I was pinned down, beaten up by a soldier and, and had a gun pointed at my face. Uh, in this event, uh, I kind of uh, felt that this, this sort of uh, interaction with the barrel of a gun pointed at you. has, I don't know, it, I am still like grappling to understand it, but but this rushed back after 30 something years or 28 years that was suppressed. I, I was very much like way past beyond a lot of these experiences in my life, but some, some encounters kind of can do that. Mm -hmm. And and I was like, I need to think about this gun, broken gun, as a vessel. Uh, what happens to an object, a person, through an experience that so is so immense, or or to a soldier even? Is there any shifting? possibility is there any metamorphosis what are the residual residues of that previous function that previous form of existence that can carry into the process of metamorphosis and project itself uh, as a new reality I decided that I want these guns to say something different, make a different sound. And so I started like studying the acoustics of wind instruments, different kind of instruments and, and finding how I can actually navigate the process of making these rifles do something else besides die, die. You know that sound, that the the actual sound of killing, and 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 I am not in any form of um, wishful thinking on. Well, I mean, gun could be used to protect someone as well. Gun, gun has been used. I mean, I, I don't want to get into that part. But my question about this process is the form of metam like how they can carry a different reality when the previous reality, the previous function, the previous form of existence it's so prominent that completely dominates any process afterward so so i started making making these instruments um grappling with how i can do it it's not an easy task at all uh and then collaborating with musicians to generate sound pieces, sound sculptures, sound performances. Uh, 
and 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 generating a different reality maybe a reality of healing i am i believe in the act of healing mm -hmm. healing for me is also a radical act mm -hmm. i believe in any form of liberated future for the kurds for many stateless nations that have been victims of genocide, mass killings, occupation, linguicide, all of this, the, the only possible future that we, I think, can help us collectively is a future through which we could heal mm -hmm. from this generational wound, from this generational and intergenerational uh, violence. Uh, I, I think the persistent form of violence implemented against a collective or a collective or 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 a group of people because of their race because of their nationality because of whatever reason that puts them within this kind of umbrella continuous violence against them has residual effect amongst them as well meaning the violence circulates the violence shapes and takes different forms even i believe the violence by which colonial entities like for example a country like turkey or iran that kind of implements and 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 uses against the kurds also circulates within their own people the act of violence is this is and this kind of it's it's like a pandemic it's like a virus mm. and the only way out is healing from it and and my act is in this work is more focused on that mm. rather than talking about who does the violence and who is the victim and and how but the act of metamorphosis um which is this magical transformation from being a warm like creature to a butterfly that can fly it's just very different reality the reality of living on a leaf and the whole world you have is this cocoon or this leaf to the world of a butterfly that can go out in the skies and, and experience a completely different reality. This is the act of metamorphosis. And I and I wish that for my people, but also many other people. Um, and that's sort of the, the poetry behind the work. You have a remarkable ability to think about your work even as you're creating. And that's, I think that's very unusual. I think a lot of creative people can't analyze it while they're making it, or they need to, it, 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 those are just two different two different parts of the brain. But you seem to be a Renaissance man in that you can think about it and analyze it while you're also in the process of creating it and making it. I was struck by the note you're mentioning of healing um, because I find that your next, the next work um, that I came across is so it's almost a love letter to Kurdistan. It's called the heart of a mountain. Uh, you, I, you seem to have gone back to gone back to back home. Um, it takes place. The installation takes place on Har Haraman. Is that how it's pronounced? Haraman. It's a mountain in Rojalat, and you made an incredible installation. I'm using mirror work. Um, a mirror that consists of fragments. Um, of mirrors all pieced together in a design and installed it on a mountain as kind of a group labor, but also um, at the same time, you made a video of it as well, not just of the creation of the work, 
but also of 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 the the meaning of the work. It brings okay. together lots of different themes from Kurdish culture. You talk about the mirror work. You talk about the architecture of the mountain. You talk about the um, cur the kind of collaboration, the communal culture that made that collaboration. You talk about singing. You talk about the women's clothing and dancing. It and even even uh, and, and much more. And it's um, it's just a beautiful compendium of so much of the prof profound attractiveness and the profound and the profound anguish of Kurdish culture. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how it was to create the heart of a mountain. Thanks. You touched on almost all the aspects of it. Uh, it, it took, I think this was the longest project. I, I started envisioning and working on it before the pandemic. So it took like two and a half year, actually, or, or through the pandemic. And and finding ways in which this could be implemented, is it going to be just in in a natural landscape, like a land art um, somewhere else? Is it going to be in closer proximity to a city or a village or... All of these questions of the location, uh, where so I think, and and I collaborated and worked, um, had Hamid Nik Hamid Nikha, who is a wonderful graphic designer and Kurdish artist who is based in Rojalat, um, to to find the location first and see if that location also correlates with a certain community of the Kurds. Uh, if it's all the way in the wilderness, no one's around it, or if it's there, what, how we can approach it. And, and doing this kind of stuff, like my idea was like how I am, I can do, make an installation that I would do in any museum in America or in Europe, but out there with basic tools and equipment, sometimes you had to wait for like a specific fastening hardware for two months. Um, but we spent about a year finding that, then started engaging with the people of Horaman, where they feel the work should go, what, what has to be done, how they envision the work, what is their take, uh, how we can recirculate the work back into their lives. Maybe it's going to a school or a mosque or a, a, a city hall. When all of this was done, we also had like, Haurami Siachamana singers who really wanted to also they were like when it's done I want to go and sing like a Kurdish song there and, and then we thought about the musical background of the work what what could possibly be the music a, a Haurami speaking Kurdish musician uh, became interested and, and and created some works of music uh alongside the piece uh and and slowly the piece became together the mirror works were made um i made some and 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 send it back home and then i had a mirror worker trying to replicate my design and my work uh, and that's also like took a long time until like we had to do the installation. And at that point, we thought we need a documentation because nothing will left after the work. So 
we hired a Kurdish movie maker, a director, uh, Parviz Rostami, who also showed as the videographer of the work. And Parviz had, for his videography, is very specific. He wants specific shots. So he, he kind of also orchestrated the crew in, in a way uh, that he felt it's more cinematic for him. Um, and so without, and then the work was installed uh, and, and documented and simultaneously I asked them also, well, we have to also show a little bit of what's going on around the work, like the people and all of that part, which it was very difficult. One of the difficulties was we only had permission to document the piece and not the people, you know, not like we, we didn't have a, like a movie license, movie making license. And, 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 and the, the Iranian regime takes that very seriously. Like you have a camera, uh, it's a problem. So, so we, we kind of try to navigate that with as much like, we, we try to be very sneaky about <laughs> the, the way we, we document the work. Uh, and you know that's the video that came out um, and I'm very happy and super proud of the, the entire crew the people who helped us the people who felt very close to the work the idea was how to have them own a piece of art like feel this is theirs and they steward it, it's theirs. Um, and I think that was the goal and we succeeded. Um, and that's, I think all like, makes me feel very happy about the piece. But um, as an experience of the land art, I think it's very significant type of work to be able to carry all these stuff up the mountain install it put it together there like with basic equipment and and create a land art piece uh, that speaks to the environment to the waters to the springs to the kind of the life and and my love for the mountains um of kurdistan which i think um it's the it's the cardinal of our survival because it generates the life. It's this microclimate that produces and, and, and creates all this water rushing down, all this kind of form of life that that allows uh trees and animals and humans to to flourish within itself um and i think we out to do more justice to them uh recognize their um immense and we do i mean we do but mostly in the social political um you know no friends but but the mountains kind of proverb, um, you know, it's the most prominent. Uh, but that friend is not just like a shelter. It's also the source of life. It, it provides life in, in many different aspects uh, of uh, Kurdish civilization from the dawn of time to this, to this date. Adrian, unfortunately, our time is almost up. But I want to recommend to everyone to please go watch this amazing video. It, it will uplift you. It will make your heart soar. It will turn your heart into a helium balloon that goes into the sky because it's just such a, such a um, 
uh, such a beautiful, a beautiful thing to watch. And I very feel very fortunate to have been able to hear your thoughts about about your process and about the meaning of your work. And I think that I feel very lucky that I will be around to watch you develop as an artist. And I'm dying to know where you will go next. I think you have a, a new show going up pretty soon. Um, but I thank you very much for taking the time from your busy schedule to talk to us, to talk to us today. And thank you for contributing to Kurdish Heritage Month. My pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to me. It was a major um, kind of uplifting feeling to talk to you, Janet. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you. All right, then. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.